This is gonna be a great video. The most overpaid people in the world, the evil suit wearing CEOs. I'm probably gonna disagree with almost everything said in this video. This is gonna be absolutely fun. All right, today I wanna to begin by defining a phrase the economics of superstars. Now, it's imp that's a real phrase, by the way. Important to do this because the topic of CEOs and overpaid executives cannot be fully discussed without understanding what's actually happening. And what's actually happening is okay. the economics of superstars. Standard economic theory suggests that those with more talent should be paid more, and you would be fairly hard pressed to find someone rational who disagrees with that basic premise. An obvious example of this would be 50% of America? Am I wrong? No. The doctors or surgeons, where markedly superior skill equates to a literal increase in patient likelihood of survival, in the case of surgery or diagnostic medicine. Since there is a relatively low number of highly skilled doctors and surgeons in the population, a small change in their relative skill can equate to a very large discrepancy in salary. A doctor who is, say, 5 or 10% better than their peers at diagnostic medicine can be paid tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars more because that small discrepancy in talent is extremely impactful to the patient and for the hospital. It quite literally saves additional lives, if we're being honest, which incentivizes higher cost. This type of superstar economics is... Okay, how are we going to handle this video? What he is saying is technically correct, but technically not applicable to actual real life. This is not exactly how doctors function. Take it from someone who uh, now has, through his uh, dad's sister, gotten into a family with like seven doctors, and who are in, uh, in some are in extremely high positions. Yeah, this is not technically how it works. Huh. Well, I guess we're gonna just move on, but yeah. This is already kind of true, but doesn't fit reality. Rational, but there is a particular economy of superstars that is irrational. And today, we're gonna discuss why. First things first, the group I'm talking about is CEOs, because there is a twisted and mentally deficient assumption in modern America, and also the world, though America serves as a hyper-exaggerated example, to be sure. Hmm. That the more money you have, or the more money you make, the more intelligent or talented you must therefore be. This is an intellectually bankrupt assumption, because the fact of the matter is that there is absolutely no correlation between wealth, talent, and intelligence whatsoever. Uh, yes, that is. It's called IQ. Uh, uh, psychologically, it is established pretty much fact at this point, that no, no one even tries to dispute most of the time, that... IQ will determine what is the uh, what, what professions you are most likely to end up being in, and so on. It's a it's a pretty good standard of showing where a person is gonna end up. Things like this do work. Now they are not a hundred percent always accurate because the thing that muddies the waters here is the fact that you can be born into a family where your your your, your future is being a CEO. Do you want it or not? Technically because you, you're just the son or the daughter of someone high up in a position, and that means you're probably going to inherit that position at some point. Because obviously they're, they, they want their family to succeed and things things like that. So technically, th th the problem starts here, right? I have talked about this before, but the problem starts here. There are people who are not, uh, not completely worthy of being CEOs who are CEOs, because they have been born in wealth, because they uh, because they knew the right people, because they got lucky and things like that. But on the flip side, the, the, this is going to be the great filter for the video. Well, it's not a great filter, but it's going to be a pretty large filter because I'm going to offend a lot of people, okay? There does not exist such a thing as someone who is smart. Actually, like, I mean, I mean smart, smart, actually really smart who is sweeping floors because, you know, they, they, they just couldn't get a job. That does not happen. And for, and this is the filter part, okay? There's going to be people who want to go in the comment sections and write in, Oh, but I know this guy, he's working at McDonald's as a cashier, but he's really smart. Statistically, and from personal experience, it is more likely that you are just stupid and you are thinking that someone who has average intelligence is really smart because you're just stupid. So here's, here's a really interesting thing that happens between stupid people and average people and average people and smart people. 
When a stupid person gets told by an average person something obvious to the average person, that stupid person is capable of understanding that because the barrier is, you know, not that high. But when, and the stupid person is going to say like, oh, that's really smart. True, true. I didn't see it, but you did. Because when you point in the direction, they will be able to follow because it's not in complex. But when you have a smart person telling something Average, in this case, I would say something that is not considered that advanced by a smart person to an average person. The response is different. The response is most of the times, eh? What, what, what do you mean? What is that? Are you stupid? Because the difference between understanding something average is so ridiculously more easy than understanding something advanced. Because it's in, it's in the wording here. Advanced things require advanced understanding in things. And an average person has no advanced knowledge in anything. That's how this works. So, chances are if you're going to tell me, Oh, I know someone who's really smart. And he's, and he's sweeping floors at you know, the local gym. Chances are they're not smart. You're just stupid. And statistically, by the way, Statistics are on my side on that one. Because of average IQ distribution and average intelligence. Millionaires and billionaires, the kind that some people idolize, imitate, and elevate inside their own minds to a position of moral authority, so much so that they will even strive for and boast about their proximity to these figures. Everyone does that. That is a false equivalence. Uh, th th uh, this is psychology, uh, psychologically called... Uh, fuck, I actually forgot what it's called. But it's, uh, it's an appeal to authority? I forgot what it's called, but it's essentially the fact when a doctor tells you, you, ne you need to take this medicine, you're not going to question that much because he's a doctor, he has studied for this and so on. When a cop tells you X, you're also not going to question them that much. When someone, uh, when someone who is an authoritative figure in the field uh, tells you something, people tend to listen. This is not only just for CEOs and things like that. Because people understand the uh, implications of authority. So this is not just for CEOs. This, is, uh, this, is, this doesn't make you stupid if you look up to a CEO and say, Wow, he's smart. Emulating him would be smart. Because it pro probably is smart. Emulating what they do is probably smart. Okay? And this is what everyone does. This is not something that idiots do. Everyone does it to an extent. It's an appeal to authority. These people typically have no discernible above average talent of any kind. Research from Cornell University aimed at analyzing the role of randomness in success and failure found that, quote, an randomness. important result of the simulations is that the most successful agents are almost never the most talented ones, but those around the average of the Gaussian talent distribution, another stylized fact often reported in the literature. Yeah, yeah, this is what I've been talking about constantly. The people who get promoted are not the smartest. They're people with social skills. This is what I have been telling you from, I don't know, day one pretty much. If you want to get promoted, you don't want to be the smartest worker in, in your department. You, you want to be a good worker who is respected and liked by people. That's going to get you promoted. Because think of it logically, right? If you're the best worker in the department and you need, uh, and there's uh, and there's an uh, opportunity to advance in position, why would you ever be picked? First of all, there's no telling that you're going to succeed at that role. Second of all, you do your job way better than everyone else. So it's a really bad thing if you get moved from it because then the company needs to find a new person who can do it at, at, a, at a good level. And it's going to be hard because you were really good at that job. So this makes perfect sense. People with social skills get promoted way more often. Because you need to understand also one thing. Uh, in this case, something that is forgotten in this conversation is the fact that really, 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 really smart people overanalyze things. They're bad at making decisions. They can't explain their positions. So in a lot of cases, they're actually bad for these CEO jobs. People with more social skills are typically uh, more useful. I used this example once and I will use it a million more times. There are currently in existence around the world a lot of companies that literally require almost genius level of intelligence to be hired. 
And you would think if you have genius level intelligence, you're going to be hired. Well, the trick is actually no. They constantly hire people beyond the level of intelligence and scope that they would require because of one simple reason, social skills. There are specifically tests for the highest engineering positions, the highest chemi chemist positions, the highest scientific positions, where if you are given the test and you complete it, you have been marked for not being accepted. Yes, there are tests in this world where you can go to a job interview and you can do the test 100% correctly. And because of that, you will not get fired. Because these tests are made to actually, well, they're pretty simple. If you can complete something like that, that most likely is an extremely blatant indicator that your social skills are not good, aka you cannot work in a team, and you will not be hired. So this is exactly on point. The model shows the importance, very frequently underestimated, of lucky events in determining the final level of individual success. Since rewards and resources yes. are usually given to those that have already reached a high level of success, yes. mistakenly considered as a measure of competence slash talent, this result is even a more harmful disincentive, causing a lack of opportunity. Oh, misconception. It is, you, you can, who, okay, well, let's give the most extreme example ever. Imagine you need to hire someone to lead your multi-million, let's say like, I don't know, billion, couple of billion worth company. And let's say it's gaming because most of you are gamers, right? Who are you going to uh, hire? Bobby Kotick, who already made Blizzard fail, or a rando from the street that has no experience being a CEO. Yeah, you're obviously going to hire the guy who has experience failing as a CEO than the guy who doesn't. This is a very simple misconception. This is not that people are looking at someone who is a high, a high position and saying, Oh, he's talented. No, no, absolutely not. Most of the time, people in high positions are constantly questioned, questioning the viability of other people in high positions in real life. <laughs> Which is kind of funny, actually. But this is a misconception. You do not want to risk... It is very rarely that a risk is going to pay off where you take someone with zero experience and now they need to do, like, CEO levels of things or management level of things. It's way safer to take someone who has been at least adjacent to that position, even you if you think he's not perfect for it, than some rando who has never done anything. It's simple. Opportunities for the most talented ones. Our results highlight the risks of a paradigm that we call naive meritocracy, which fails to give honors and rewards to the most competent people because it underestimates the role of randomness among the determinants of success. End yep. quote. In essence, the millionaires and billionaires that these sheep, for lack of a better word, all look up to and strive to emulate are nothing but an average coalition of significantly lucky individuals who are now treated as exceptional. Uh, now he's specifically kind of talking about the people I mentioned at the start, that you can't be just lucky and born the offspring of a millionaire or a billionaire, and then you're probably going to become the CEO of that company at some point. Even though you are significantly below your, uh, you know, the one who built it at the first place. Yeah, so this introduces, it's unavoidable. And this is what actually gives a lot of CEOs a bad rep. Because you constantly see people, you constantly see people in uh, high positions who have gotten in high positions, not because they're good, not even because they have good social skills, but because they know someone. Typically, you know, their father's rich and then they have, you know, connections and things like that. Everyone who has been, everyone who has been even slightly up the ladder probably can attest, uh, can attest to a situation like that like once or two times already seen in their life if they have work experience of, I don't know, even five years just, just like that. It happens. And you know why? Because the others, because the others are obviously trying to ma uh, make their their families win, their offsprings win, their friends win, because that's where power lies. By measure of wealth, as if it were a proxy for competence and talent. Why am I talking about this? Well, also, it typically is to a degree. 
Here's a list of the S&P 500 CEOs and their relative compensation packages. Tens of millions of dollars per superstar, often 100 or 200 times the median household income in the United States. And this particular group of superstars are often traded between companies like the nice. star players of a basketball team. Increasingly wealthy, increasingly high compensation, and escalating benefits. Now, according to standard economic theory, if talent were to be the determining factor, one might expect that these CEOs are disproportionately skilled, therefore justifying their disproportionate pay scale. However, the painful truth here is that the most overpaid people on the planet do not deserve the money. Let me just round out the context here. Since 1978, CEO is compensation be a pure using the top 350 think? firms in the U.S. as a sample here has skyrocketed over 1,460%. To where they are now paid roughly four yes you know why because the ceos are smart <laughs> they increase their pay every chance they get obviously obviously you know is uh, you know what's one of the most blinding differences between someone who's a ceo and someone who is an average everyday joe burker the CEO is instantaneously going to put his name on something that uh, that is even the remote success and things like that. Uh, while the average show is going to be, oh, I didn't do that much, Dad. I, uh, blah, blah, blah. That's bad marketing. You have already failed. You're already proven yourself to be worse than the CEO. If you're not going to take the, uh, the glory of a random event that happened, that's on you, Chief, for just being stupid. 100 times higher than an average worker. Comparatively, since 1984... According to the average wage index, workers have gone from $15,250 annual compensation to $58,129 in 2021. Okay, when factoring for inflation, increase, however, $15,250 in 1984 was almost $38,000 today, meaning that while workers might see an appearance of wage growth, what they really have is relative stagnation. So it's not actually even a 100% increase in wages, he's just saying. Nation. Now, as I talk about CEOs and the How economics of superstars, it quickly becomes clear that these superstars don't play by the same rules as the rest of us. Yes. When you get fired, they tell you to... He's 100% correct. Yes. And again, every... I have a feeling everything he's going to say about CEOs being bad and stupid, I'm just going to say, yeah, that's what a smart person does. Yeah. I... And here he's going to talk about CEOs... Uh, he's... Okay, my prediction is he's here gonna start talking about how CEOs say, Oh, we're all a giant big family here, blah, 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 blah. We, you put in the work, extra hours if it's needed. We all need to, we need, we need to you know, roll this boulder up a hill. I have a feeling this is exactly where that he's going with this typical stupid dog, by the way. As I have said it many times before, you know what I haven't done ever? I have never lifted up uh, a heavy box on my own if anyone told me to. Why? Because my back is more important than that shitty fucking company to me. A lot of people don't have that mentality. A lot of people are gonna lift heavy shit, break their backs, ruin their health. For what? For what at the end of the day? For nothing, exactly. No one's gonna t say, uh, say thank you at the end. When you're done because you have health issues and whatnot, the company's not gonna give you treatment, give you a pension for the rest of time, and create a memorial for you to, uh, to be remembered for. No. They're gonna say goodbye. The CEO completely understands that he needs to manipulate you people by, uh, by saying good things that you want to hear. And you're being idiots for actually buying it. And guess what? I have, ne I have never done things like that. I have never put myself in the line of a fire or anything like that. And guess what? Still top dog, baby. Exactly. Why? Because I understand value. Self-value. To clear out your desk, and you're lucky to even get legally required benefits without having to specifically fight for them. When they get fired, they make millions even as the companies they purportedly manage deteriorate completely. True. It's actually incredibly rare for a CEO to ever be held fiscally accountable for anything. They might yes. get ousted from the company with a few media headlines in tow, perhaps, but they almost always receive golden parachute bonuses or massive windfall stock awards in the process. Obviously. Randall Stevenson, prior CEO of AT&T, as just one example. Because the CEO is never responsible for anything bad, but always responsible for everything good. 
If you can't sell that to people, you're not a good CEO. Made $32 million during the same pandemic fiscal year that the company fired 20,000 workers. That's good over man, 500 times man. the average salary in the United States, solely to a man who presided over 20,000 people losing their jobs during a pandemic. Good. To me, it's a damn shame, but there are, on occasion, examples where a company will take some degree of action. Qantas, an Australian airline company, is one such example, and I only know about this example because of today's video sponsor, Ground News. The gist of it is that Qantas was booking thousands of tickets on flights that were already canceled, leading to intervention from regulators, yet the superstar CEO was taking a 900% pay increase on his way out the door. Thankfully, okay. the company is clawing back some of his bonus pay and reducing short-term incentives, but examples like that are few and far between. Normally, chief executives will reap enormous rewards even when they steer the company into the dirt, and yes. I wouldn't have been aware of that example without ground news. The complexity of modern media... Yeah. True. And again, that's because the CEOs know what they are doing, okay? It, hey. <laughs> it is what it is. Again, th this, is, th th this is not CEOs being stupid and incompetent. No, this is CEOs taking all the opportunities. People, people who usually succeed, you know what they do? They take opportunities. Pretty simple stuff, really. Average people don't take opportunities. Media with intertwining issues of bias, partisanship, and corporate influence demands some sort of solution. After a six-month vetting process, I decided to work with Ground News, which is an app and website that compiles sources worldwide in one place, providing different perspectives. Each story showcases coverage details and bias distribution, which provides a... In my individual research, Ground News has become a relatively indispensable tool, offering access to view all sides of every story. I'm excited to have them as a continued sponsor on the channel because they're an independent and subscriber-supported platform contributing to media accountability, which is huge for me. Go to ground.news slash echelon with the link down below to take advantage of their best deal this year. You'll get 40% off unlimited access to their app, website, and newsletters. Big thank you to Ground News for sponsoring the channel. So having established the abominable scale of compensation and the relatively unique set of rules that these executives play by, one might somehow still expect that their performance can justify all of that. After all, keeping with our example of a surgeon it usually does. or a doctor, superstar economics kind of makes sense. However, this is where I have to draw from research and connect a series of dots. According to analysis on CEO compensation by Xavier Gabay and Augustine Landier, who developed mathematical formulas for measuring relative compensation and performance, most importantly, from page 84, quote, plugging in the numerical values mentioned above, the last number is 0.016%. This number means that if firm number 250 could, at no extra salary cost, replace its CEO for a year with the best CEO in the economy, its market capitalization would go up by only 0.016%. This is arguably- This is the stupidest thing I have heard in my life. One year is a fallacy. Nothing can be changed in one year unless you want to burn the company to the goddamn ground. One year? We, we might as well make it one second or one day. It would honestly be the same thing. You need to understand scale. You can't switch a whole, a whole company with... In this case, they're literally talking about companies with 2,000 plus employees and whatnot. You can't switch these companies to work differently in a year. If the CEO wants to make drastic changes, he will come in. He will start to uh, figure out how the company works and what's important and what, not, and what is not important. Then he will start replacing the department heads and people, uh, people of high position with people he thinks are better or he can trust more. And that alone is going to be a process that takes a year. One year? This study is bullshit. A minuscule difference in talent. Even a department can't act. Dude, e even a small company, a department of 10 people can't, uh, can't switch themselves up in a one year uh, properly. They're going to only be able to switch up a couple of things probably in six months. One year? That is absolute as bull as it gets. End quote. 
Now, I should add here that this is referring to very large, well-established companies. There is a very clear ability for CEOs to damage the company they work for by making objectively asinine decisions. But when discussing the performance of an established entity, the math demonstrated here seems to indicate that they have... What about objectively asinine decisions, by the way? I really wondered here. Because we, we live in a world bit, for example... Bob, uh, let's take a Blizzard for example, Bobby Kotick, my favorite Bobster of the Bobs, you know? Bobby Kotick is being blamed for everything bad that happens to the company. But Bobby Kotick did not make uh, Diablo 4 shit. It was the fa- it, 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 it was the lesbian dungeon designers who have never played the game and have uh, I- impactful decision making in the games. Bobby Kotick did not do that. Bobby Kotick cannot change absolutely everything. And especially in the situation where if he decides to fire the, uh, the Volk mob, that it's going to get cancelled again. <laughs> Dude, okay, in this situation, we need to actually talk about what is CEO accountability. Because CEOs don't actually look at what the bottom people do. CEOs are the ones that look at the, uh, at the typically just the results of each department and sometimes they look in a little bit deeper to how things like that are happening. Dude, it's like, what kind of accountability are we even attributing to CEOs in this situation? Effectively zero impact on upward mobility. And yet, a CEO who has no positive impact whatsoever is increasingly rewarded with compensation growth year after year. Yes, that also makes perfect perfect logical sense. You know why it makes perfect logical sense that that compensation increases year after year? Because maybe you can't increase the profits by 100% per year. That's fine. But you're not also destroying the company. Go ahead. Put some rando dude who has never even worked as a manager, as a CEO of a company... Watch how it crumbles in literal months. That can be done without problem. That is easy. Could, uh, we're currently thinking about under the false assumption that being a C, be, uh, that these companies can't crumble with the wrong decision making. They can. Make enough wrong decisions you crumble. Look at Activision Blizzard. They failed. Stock price dropped. Now they're owned by Microsoft. This happens constantly. Dwarfing every other position type in the world. The question is why? We are witnessing a group of people earning tens or hundreds of millions of dollars per year, escalating that pay scale at a rate above anything they could ever deserve. But why? And the answer to that why because is Because they everybody. deserve it. According to research from the Illinois University Economics Department as far back as 2007, analyzing changes in money supply related to stock market prices, quote, the results of this study suggest that the real activity hypothesis dominates Keynesian theory. The results support the view of the real activity hypothesis that a positive money supply shock would increase the stock prices and vice versa. The results also support the opponents of efficient market hypothesis that anticipated change in money supply matter more than unanticipated changes in money supply in determining the stock prices." End quote. Effectively, money supply is a driving force behind okay, stock market sense. prices, aka market capitalization for major companies, but going further, as far back as 1990, according to Harvard Business Review, there was virtually no link between how much CEOs were paid and how well their companies performed for shareholders. How is that possible? Simple. Easy. Massive infusions of capital into the United States economy, among others, create upward pressure on market capitalization, especially for major top 350 companies. In turn, the CEOs of those companies are able to harvest enormous compensation packages and leverage their career prospects further, despite being holistically undeserving of that pay scale. Even worse, we can see the effects of cash infusion in separate but related fields as well. A Wait, should I explain the... Okay, I'm gonna explain so everyone, under everyone understands in, in, case, in case anything. It's essentially just the fact that CEOs get rewarded for performance, and performance in this case is like one for one correlated with stock prices. But stock prices prices go down by uh, go up by default, because that's just how stocks work over time. There's no such thing that goes down or uh, or you know sideways. Just 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 because you know the things happen. No, every stock naturally has an incline increase because well. To be honest, it's actually a real thing that stock becomes more valuable just because it survives. 
Uh, the, a good example of this thing and why it's legit and why people are mad about this is hedge funds. A lot of people are constantly ripping on hedge funds for the fact that, oh, they don't, uh, oh, uh, they don't, they, uh, the typical hedge fund never uh, over overperforms the S&P. Oh, the typical uh, uh, hedge fund ne never uh, outperforms this and that. True. But you do, uh, there's a misunderstanding in that also. It's the fact that hedge funds are not trying to uh, outperform the S&P 500 or anything like that. Uh, hedge funds are actually trying to, uh, you know, make sure that that money doesn't vanish in case of anything bad happening. That's the real reason hedge funds exist. They don't exist to just make money for rich people. No, they exist to keep money safe. In case something happens and everyone gets 50% more poor, the people who have money in hedge funds get 0% more poor or maybe minus 10% more poor. They leverage risk. Okay, they want to alleviate, uh, their goal is to alleviate as much risk as possible. Unicorn startup refers to a startup company valued at over a billion dollars. Historically, hence the name, they are quite rare, as one might expect. However, in the know? aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, after an unprecedented amount of money was injected directly into the United States economy at nearly every single level, particularly concentrated in the hands of existing large companies who abused the framework with impunity, there was a massive spike in the number of unicorn startups that broke onto the scene as a function of venture capital. According to Inc.com, 2021 spawned more unicorns than the past five years combined. Wow. And yet immediately afterward, they came crashing back down to earth. Why? Because they should never have existed in the first place. The only reason they did is because excess capital was injected into the market, allowing hundreds of people to join the ranks of the CEOs despite the failure of a company they helmed being nothing more than a parasite in the aftermath of irresponsible government spending, where they can now leverage that position, <laughs> for what it's worth, nice. into a never-ending, nearly exponential increase in pay scale and stock options as they engage in the economy of superstars who aren't actually superstars and typically bring nothing Wait, of a... Wait, also, a small thing to consider is the reason to see uh, the CEO... Uh, salaries go up because typically in the CEO salaries uh, you count in stock <laughs> you count in stock so yeah stock go up as as it should CEO salaries technically go up with it that's why uh, that's why in some situations they do use the word uh, specifically the uh, uh, use the words fuck, what, what 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 is the correct terminology here but essentially they don't say that this is how much they uh, they they uh, they got paid on paper. This is how much they actually got paid on that tier. There is a difference. Mathematically measurable. Because on paper, it account uh, it it accounts for uh, stock increases because the stock price is you know, okay. So, on paper, a CEO's salary. Can, is also partly stock and all of these things and the stock price is not we're gonna give you a hundred shares no 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 no. the stock price is well you're gonna after this year you're gonna be awarded i don't know a hundred shares of company x and you are awarded because well you, you're not awarded a hundred a uh, hundred shares you're awarded what would be the equivalent of ten thousand in shares and the next year because you still have those shares People, uh, people like to say, oh, oh, he actually, di he didn't make that much. He actually made like 20k because the shares went up. That's how it works. It's a, pr it's not really a deceptive thing, but I'm not even sure what, the, what we attribute this to. Just sheer ignorance or what? Value to the table. Bottom line, a small group of people, the CEOs, which I cannot possibly say with more venom, even if I tried, are being paid hundreds of times more than their peers despite having no actual talent beyond them. They are perceived... What's the peer of a CEO? ...perceived as intellectually or talentedly superior as a result of the non-merit-based success they already have, leading to compensation that rises faster and further than anyone else around them, despite being and contributing nothing of actual unique value. Their compensation and performance are mostly decoupled from shareholder returns, and while it can be argued that the lack of downside impact by a CEO is probably worth paying for, 
so they don't run your company into the ground with their idiocy. Okay, also, a f final question. Do you think, how much do you think CEOs work typically per day? Two hours, three hours, they usually take, you know, every second day off, or maybe it's closer to 16 hours per day. Most CEOs work 16 fucking hours per day. That is reality. Because every time you hear you hear someone say, oh, the CEO is out, out, out on dinner. Yeah, they are out on a dinner on, a, on probably to some fancy restaurant. But they're not there for leisure and pleasure. They're there on a meeting with something, discussing something that matters, okay? That's how it works. A lot of people just have this innate misunderstanding that CEOs and things uh, and people of, of high uh, of high acclaim in the in the business ladder that they don't work a lot now granted there are CEOs that I personally ha know that don't actually work a lot because they have because they have made their businesses and by the way those are usually women by the way no seriously typically they're women uh, those are CEOs that have made it, that they have, they need very little interference in the everyday activities of a company. That everyone uh, working under them is completely capable of single-handedly doing the job. And then they come in for like a, a week in a month. That does happen, but that's pretty extremely rare. Okay? And even those people still usually get like, Every two days, an e email of the things that happened. If they, in case they want to look into that, but you know that does happen. There are CEOs that really do not work a lot because they have made the companies so, uh, so successful that they don't need to do it. And by the way, typically, typically, these are uh, very small companies. Also, I mean, making uh, making millions is still pretty good, right? But typically, these are not multi-billion dollar companies. Again, the typical CEO works way more than your average 9 to 5 fiver, okay? Even if the 9 to fiver is doing like an extra hour or two every day. It should also be understood that when government monetary policy has more impact on market cap than average CEO performance by far, yet these executives are being compensated 400 times higher than anyone else around them, there's a fundamental problem. The economy of superstars can be seen in a variety of contextual situations. Sports, of course, medicine, commerce, etc. But when it comes to executives and their pay scale, you have a group of people who are categorically not more talented, typically do not impact the company in sizable or upwardly mobile ways, but are still compensated hundreds of times higher than they should be on a trajectory that increasingly hard... Okay, yeah, this is definitely the end. Okay, not more talented technically is true. But at the same time, you need to understand that there is a level where um, there is a point where being uh, smart starts to become a detriment. We had this discussion previously and someone commented a uh, real, uh, really good thing for, uh, from their experience. And it, it was the fact that in the company that that guy worked, analysts, the best analysts were never promoted. Because the the analysts who were the best were typically the smartest, highest IQ people in the company, and they never got promoted up because uh, they questioned their decisions too much. Oh, this is actually, again, this is also a really nice story that I have. Um, I have seen so many situations where uh, department heads and people uh, people of very high status do just the most fucking randomest of things without any risk aversion, without any real prospects, just because it needs to be done and we need to see what happens. Like, se seriously, like, big decisions without any, uh, without any testing, is this good or is this not? Because they, 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 you need to have someone in the leadership position who is capable of making real decisions, okay? They need, they know, they... You can't have someone in leadership position that's going to say, yeah, we need to test this for three more months. Well, there are situations where that's necessary. But you need someone who is going to be able to uh, say, yeah, okay, looks good enough. We're going to do it. We're not going to test for five more years until we figure out that this is A-OK. -okay. No, you need the people who are going to take risks sometimes also.
harvest more than their fair share <laughs> excessively, which they do not deserve. CEOs simply do not perform a job that justifies the pay they receive, and this can be mathematically supported. They demonstrate- If that's your mathematical support in a fucking year, then, I, then I'm a pixie fairy. Anyway, I need to poop, so this is the end of the video. That was Upper Echelon Game. Very good channel, very interesting topics, but every time I hear some of him talking about businesses and CEOs, I kind of die inside a little bit. Anyway, this was Quizzer Said Sand. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. I'm going to go poop.